Chapter 5, Einstein and Godel, Great Minds Era Alike Every day, the two of them, Einstein and Godel, would walk home together from the Institute, deep in conversation, and others watched them and wondered. Rebecca Goldstein Einstein is an interesting case in the context of this book's focus on the political irrationality of philosophers. Although he was, of course, not strictly a philosopher, he was hugely admired by all logical positivists and philosophers of science, who thought some of his work, primarily the theory of relativity, should be also classified as an outstanding contribution to philosophy, not just to physics. He was often treated as a fellow philosopher, which is reflected in the fact that one of the early volumes of the prestigious Library of Living Philosophers was devoted to him. Albert Einstein, Philosopher-Scientist, published in 1949. I am not alone in pointing to this book as a signal of Einstein's standing as a philosopher, for one of the many articles that try to demonstrate Einstein's philosophical relevance, see Norton 2010, which analyzes some of Einstein's most important scientific contributions and argues that he quite consciously integrated philosophical analysis into his physical theorizing. We saw in the previous chapter that, like Carnap, Einstein supported Henry Wallace's bid for the presidency. Given Wallace's pro-Soviet views expressed during the campaign, one might wonder whether this kind of attitude is also detectable in Einstein's thinking. The answer is yes. It is true that Einstein was often critical of the Soviet Union. Nevertheless, it cannot be denied that on certain occasions he either tried to justify or refused to condemn some of the darkest actions of Russian communists, including Stalin. This is incompatible with Einstein's standard image as a humane and kind-hearted sage. A soft spot for Lenin. This is what Einstein had to say in 1929, on the fifth anniversary of Lenin's death. In Lenin, I admire a man who has thrown all his energy into making social justice real, at the sacrifice of his own person. I do not consider his method practicable. But one thing is sure. Men like him are the guardians and reformers of the conscience of mankind. Notice the only thing Einstein says about the Leninist method is that he does not consider it practicable. The German word Einstein used is Zweckmessig, literally, conducive to the goal. So his only criticism of Lenin's method is that it would not achieve its goal. There was no condemnation or moral disapprobation of the method itself, nor even any hint that it was widely criticized as highly unethical. If one knows that a politician killed thousands of innocent people in order to achieve his goal, usually one would not object merely that the politician's method was impractical or not conducive to his goal. Indeed, why did Einstein praise Lenin so profusely as a guardian and reformer of the conscience of mankind, despite evidence, easily accessible at the time, that massive atrocities had been perpetrated under his leadership during the first years of the Soviet Union. For reasons of space, I will mention only two well-known sources from the 1920s that pointed to dark aspects of Lenin's politics. In 1924, a book titled The Red Terror in Russia, 1918-1923, appeared in Berlin, in German. The author, Sergei Melganov, was sentenced to death by the Bolsheviks in 1919 and later, after his sentence was commuted to imprisonment, was forced into exile. The book contains a wealth of information about proclamations and actions of the Soviet government under Lenin. An illustration is a statement by Martin Latsis, a high official of Cheka, the Soviet secret police, which was issued and widely disseminated in 1918. We are eradicating bourgeoisie as a class. Do not seek evidence during the investigation that the accused acted or spoke against the Soviet government. The first question that you must ask would be, what class do you belong to? What is your background, upbringing, education, or trade? These questions must seal the fate of the accused. A particularly relevant section of Melganov's book is Chapter 6, Bloody Statistics, which documents the horrors of communist rule in detail, year by year. I am not suggesting that Einstein had to take Melganov's accusations at face value. My point is, rather, that in light of such and many other similar troubling reports about the Bolsheviks, a reasonable person should have been, at the very least, reluctant to call Lenin a guardian and reformer of the conscience of mankind. 
This is especially true of Einstein, who knew he had a considerable influence on world opinion. Another source that should have dampened Einstein's enthusiasm for Lenin was the book Letters from Russian Prisons, published in New York in 1925, which presented letters from many of those who had spent years under horrible conditions in labor camps just because they had expressed disagreement with the politics of the Soviet government. The book has a section with comments from celebrated intellectuals from the West, including Einstein. Here is the full version of Einstein's reaction to the letters from the political prisoners. If you study these accounts as a reader in a peaceful, well-regulated system of government, don't imagine that those around you are different and better than those who conduct a regime of terror in Russia. Shudder to view this tragedy of human history where one murders out of fear that one will be murdered. It is the best, the most altruistic, who are tortured and killed because their political influence is feared, but not just in Russia. All serious men owe a debt of gratitude to the editor of these documents. He will help to reverse this dreadful fate. After the publication of these documents, the rulers of Russia will have to change their methods if they wish to continue their effort to gain moral credibility with civilized nations. They will lose all sympathy if they cannot show through a great and courageous act of liberation that they do not need to rely on bloody terror to lend support to their political ideals. Two comments. First, like anyone else, Einstein obviously wanted to condemn the labor camps, but he nevertheless tried to downplay the natural revolt against those who were responsible for them. He said to people in the West who abhorred the treatment of the detainees of the early gulag, don't imagine that those around you are different and better than those who conduct a regime of terror in Russia. This somehow normalizes the terror, suggesting, oddly, that those perpetrating it are in no way different from, nor worse than, ordinary people one meets every day. But later, Einstein would never dream of similarly normalizing the behavior of the Nazi leaders, nor of the Germans as a whole for that matter. Also, his decision when talking about torture and killings to add, but this did not happen only in Russia, again has the effect of normalizing the terror and neutralizing the outrage it generates. This is like saying, yes, it's terrible, but this happens elsewhere too, so there is no reason to focus too much on the Bolsheviks, really. Second, Einstein says the rulers of Russia will lose all sympathy if they do not renounce the terror, but this was not true of his own reaction to them. Lenin never renounced the terror, yet Einstein called him a guardian and reformer of the conscience of mankind. And for Stalin, too. In Einstein's correspondence with the physicist Max Born, the issue of the Moscow trials of the 30s came up. In an undated letter written sometime in 1937 or 1938, Einstein gives his opinion. By the way, there are increasing signs that the Russian trials are not faked, but that there is a plot among those who look upon Stalin as a stupid reactionary who has betrayed the ideas of the revolution. Though we find it difficult to imagine this kind of internal thing, those who know Russia best are all more or less of the same opinion. I was firmly convinced to begin with that it was a case of a dictator's despotic acts based on lies and deception, but this was a delusion. The amazing thing is that Einstein managed to swallow the Stalinist story after he had already been firmly convinced it was based on lies and deceptions. What kind of evidence could have convinced him to change his mind and give full credence to accusations of the infamous Stalinist prosecutor Andrei Vyshinsky? It is hard to see how this conversion could have been based on rational considerations especially since Einstein had such easy access to many credible sources of information that pointed to the weakness of the prosecution case. Speaking about the Moscow trials, it is difficult to disagree with Tony Judd's statement that the steady stream of absurd admissions of guilt convinced only the most nakedly servile of communist intellectuals. And this was not the first time Einstein had reversed himself and withdrawn his support for the victims of political persecution in the Soviet Union. He did something even worse in 1931, when he used his huge fame in support of a terrible miscarriage of justice, and that time he did it publicly.
Initially, he joined a group of European intellectuals in a campaign against the prosecution of 48 wreckers in the USSR because the accusations against them seemed to him to be based on flimsy evidence and probably politically motivated. Soon, however, the Berlin journal Das Neue Russland, published by the Society of Friends of the New Russia Four, of which Einstein was a founding member, issued the following explanation by Einstein about why he had changed his mind. I gave my signature at the time, after some hesitation, because I trusted in the competency and honesty of the persons who had approached me about this signature, and also because I considered it psychologically impossible that people bearing the full responsibility for implementing technical tasks of utmost importance could purposefully harm the cause they are supposed to be serving. Today I regret most profoundly that I gave this signature, because I have since lost confidence in the correctness of my views at that time. I was not sufficiently aware then that under the special conditions of the Soviet Union, things were possible that are totally unthinkable to me under conditions familiar to me. Notice how little sense Einstein's explanation makes. He was not sufficiently aware that in the Soviet Union things can happen that are elsewhere psychologically impossible and totally unthinkable. Yes, the USSR, a land of wonders. Seriously, the very way that Einstein accounted for his conversion raises a grave suspicion that it was caused by something other than a rational assessment of evidence. The view he started with, and later renounced, that the insinuated sabotage did not make any psychological sense, was eminently plausible. Why was the unthinkability of the accusations not sufficient to counteract any of the proofs provided to Einstein by his pro-Soviet sources? And why didn't he mention any alleged evidence that ultimately convinced him of the wrecker's guilt? The saddest part of Einstein's involvement is that in this particular case, no evidence had been presented that could have changed his mind for the simple reason that there was no real court case at all, not even a sham Stalinist show trial. This is how the whole thing started. In the past September of 1930, there was an ominous rumbling across the land. 48 people, wreckers in the food supply chain were sentenced to be shot. Responses from workers appeared in the newspapers. Wreckers must be wiped from the face of the earth. The front page of his vestia proclaimed, crush the serpent beneath your heel. And the proletariat demanded that the OGPU, the early name for the security and political police of the Soviet Union, be awarded the Order of Lenin. The first news about the arrest of 48 counter-revolutionaries mostly scientists, was published on September 22, 1930. Only three days later, it was announced that all of them had been shot. Many reacted by circulating the following macabre joke. Now the Kremlin has acted to solve the meat shortage by slaughtering 48 professors. Vladimir Chernovin was associated with the wreckers, but he was not executed. He ended up in the Gulag, but later managed to escape to England and write a book that is a good source of information about the whole case. He comments on the execution of his colleagues. Such a monstrous slaughter was beyond belief. 48 of Russia's foremost scientists had been shot without trial. The most pessimistically inclined could not have imagined anything so horrible. What would Chernovin have thought if he had been aware that Einstein, with his public change of heart, had actually made it easier to spread the lie that the accused were criminals rather than victims of such a monstrous slaughter. Six, and more interestingly, how long was the period during which Einstein occasionally expressed the belief, against his better judgment, that the accused in the Stalinist parodies of justice were guilty? The answer, at least six years, it is documented for the period between 1931 and 1937, probably longer. Einstein revealed his soft spot for the Soviet Union on other occasions as well. For instance, the journalist and writer Isaac Don Levine, who was on good terms with Einstein for years, contacted him after the assassination of party official Sergei Kirov in 1934 and asked him to join protests against Stalin's retaliations that involved the execution of many people without any investigation or trial. In his response on December 10, 1934, Einstein explained he could not join the protest because, in his opinion, 
its only probable effect would be in countries that were not friendly to Russia. Then he added, Under the circumstances, I regret your action and suggest you abandon it altogether. We see that Einstein's protectiveness toward the Soviet Union went so far that he not only refused to take part in Levine's protest, he actively tried to dissuade him from organizing any public condemnation of Stalin's bloodbath. And then came a statement from Einstein that is even more difficult to comprehend. Consider further that the Russians have proved that their only aim is really the improvement of the lot of the Russian people, and that they can, in this regard, already show important achievements. Levine's response to Einstein contains a pointed retort. I was grieved to read your statement that the only aim of the Soviet rulers is the improvement of the people's condition. How can one reconcile that belief with the fact that in 1933, from three to five million peasants were deliberately starved to death by the Stalin regime? How did Einstein answer that question? He did not. As Levine reports, the letter remained unanswered and to my grief terminated a relationship which had lasted over 10 years. The same thing happened in 1948 in a better-known debate on the same topic between Einstein and Sidney Hook. In one letter, Einstein again made a similar point about the great merits of the Soviet system of government. I am not blind to the serious weaknesses of the Russian system of government, and I would not like to live under such government. But it has, on the other side, great merits and it is difficult to decide whether it would have been possible for the Russians to survive by following softer methods. Predictably, Hook responded vehemently, Precisely what methods have you in mind? I am puzzled on what evidence anyone can assert that cultural purges and terror in astronomy, biology, art, music, literature, the social sciences, helped the Russians to survive, or how the millions of victims in concentration camps of the Soviet Union, not to speak of the wholesale executions, contributed in any way to the Russian victory over Hitler. Again, there was no reply from Einstein. Recruitment by remote control. Given that Einstein was obviously not a communist, why was he, as shown above, reluctant to criticize Stalin's rule, sometimes even urging others to keep their mouths shut about it? And why did he and some other prominent intellectuals often take part in communist infiltrated initiatives like, say, agreeing to be sponsors of the notorious Waldorf Peace Conference in 1949 in New York? Even in its preparatory stages, the Waldorf Peace Conference carried the clear signature of heavy communist involvement, and many knowledgeable political commentators suspected the primary purpose of the conference was to serve as propaganda for the USSR presenting it as the main force for peace in the contemporary world. Even if one were not immediately convinced by warnings that participants would turn out to be useful idiots, many observers questioned the judgment of people like Einstein and Carnap, as well as others like Thomas Mann, Arthur Miller, Charlie Chaplin, Linus Pauling, and Leonard Bernstein, who agreed to be associated with a conference widely suspected of having been organized and or dominated by Stalinists. It did not matter either that the State Department warned that the conference would be manipulated by the communists and that none of the cultural leaders of Eastern Europe would be free to express any view other than that dictated by the political authorities in Moscow. Indeed, this is exactly what happened. Soon after the conference started, the sponsors had good reason to have second thoughts about their involvement. What they might have found especially troubling was the speech of the famous Russian composer Dmitry Shostakovich. His speech, if it really was his, was read by an interpreter, while Shostakovich sat next to him and appeared nervous and uneasy. The speech contained the composer's response to the recent criticism of his music by the Central Committee of the Communist Party. The criticism brings me much good. It helps me bring my music forward. About Stravinsky, whose work had been condemned in the Soviet Union, Shostakovich concurred with the party's opinion, saying, Stravinsky betrayed his native land and severed himself from his people by joining the camp of reactionary modern musicians. Later, it transpired that Shostakovich had tried hard to avoid participating in the conference, giving various excuses to the Soviet authorities, his health situation, 
criticisms of his music in editorials in Pravda, etc. Then one day he was informed that he would receive an important phone call. When the phone rang, it was Stalin on the line, politely requesting that Shostakovich join the delegation and travel to New York. Of course, this was an invitation he couldn't refuse. But in contrast to Shostakovich, who attended the conference because otherwise his life would be in grave danger, Einstein and others did not have that excuse for their sponsorship. They had not received a phone call from Stalin, and no one was in a position to threaten them. They became involved of their own free will, and were even proud of it. The literary critic Morris Dickstein, in a review of a biography of Arthur Miller, neatly summarizes this phenomenon in connection with Miller's participation in the Waldorf event. It was one thing to be a radical in the 1930s, but to remain a fellow traveler throughout the 1940s, culminating in the notorious Stalinist-inspired Waldorf Peace Conference in New York in 1949, long after the crimes, purges, and repressions of Stalin had been exposed to the world, demanded a special kind of obtuseness. In fairness to Einstein, it should be noted that immediately after the Waldorf Conference, he realized he had made a mistake. In a letter to the mathematician Jacques Hadamard on April 7, 1949, he wrote, In answer to your cable, I must frankly confess that in view of my experience with the first Congress of this kind in Rotslaw last August, and from what I have observed concerning the recent Congress in New York, I have the strong impression that this kind of procedure does not really serve the cause of international understanding. The reason is simply that it is more or less a Soviet enterprise, and everything is managed accordingly. Still, as far as I know, Einstein never publicly acknowledged that he had changed his mind about the Waldorf Conference, nor divulged that he had been basically duped by the crudest Stalinist propaganda. Why did he change his mind, though? It is hard to tell, but it is interesting to note that only three days before Einstein wrote that letter to Hadamard, Life magazine published a long article headlined Red Visitors Cause Rumpus that ridiculed the naivete of those who supported the conference, describing them as ranging from hard-working fellow travelers to soft-headed do-gooders. The article ended with the following sentence. The Communist Front organizations have been exposed often enough, however, so that by now the perennial joiner whose friends try to excuse him because he is just a dupe, is clearly a super dupe. In contrast to Einstein, Rudolf Carnap never budged later, even in private correspondence. Twenty years after the event, he was still proud that he gave his name as a sponsor for the peace conference. One year after Waldorf, Carnap supported the 1950 Stockholm Peace Appeal, another initiative that was also widely regarded as a communist front and for this reason strongly condemned even by people with impeccable leftist credentials. For example, Tage Erlander, Prime Minister of Sweden and the leader of the Social Democratic Party, didn't mince words. We have noticed lately that communists, both in Sweden and abroad, have intensified their propaganda for the so-called Stockholm Peace Appeal. I must confess that it is with feelings of considerable disgust that we hear in Sweden witness the brandishing of the name of our capital in this way in the international communist propaganda. The overwhelming majority of the Swedish people have no sympathy to spare for the attempts of the communists to exploit for their own ends, mankind's love for peace and abhorrence of war. The German left of center weekly Die Zeit published a short article on August 3, 1950, warning about the Stockholm peace appeal being a communist machination. It said at the beginning, the white dove is a symbol of peace. No one can object to that. But if the dove suddenly appears in red plumage, there is reason to be suspicious. Carnap, however, found nothing to be suspicious about. Getting back to our question about how Einstein, Carnap, and others ended up getting involved with organizations and activities widely thought to be forums for Soviet propaganda, an obvious suggestion would be that they, and possibly many others, had been wooed by acquaintances with moderate-sounding views who insisted that their politics were primarily progressive, resolutely anti-fascist and peace-oriented, and who carefully avoided any directly Soviet-style, crude rhetoric that could upset the people they were trying to recruit. <laughs>
Louise Budins, an American former communist turned informer, reports that this is exactly how these celebrated intellectuals were induced to associate themselves with Soviet-backed activities, and that the method even had a name, remote control. The relationships with Thomas Mann and Einstein were established by what the communists called remote control, while I was still part of the Red leadership. The chain of communication with Mann ran through associates of his daughter Erica, while with Einstein, means of reaching him were set up at Princeton. In both instances, these men were persuaded to their pro-communist stands by playing upon their hatred of Nazism. This I know from what I heard said in Politburo meetings. No more striking illustration could be found of the way well-known men and women of unquestionable integrity are deceived and exploited by the communists. Although some may wonder whether Budens should be regarded as a trustworthy source, in this particular case, his account seems to be the most plausible, as well as the most charitable explanation of how Einstein was politically manipulated into actions that served Soviet interests. Some of Einstein's Soviet connections, however, raise more troubling questions. In a brief but richly documented article, Frederick S. Litton describes the case of Hilaire Newlands, an official of the Communist International, Comintern, who was arrested in China in 1931 because of his political activities against the regime. Einstein repeatedly intervened on Newland's behalf and even sent telegrams to three U.S. senators asking for their help in this affair. Lytton argues, on one hand, that it is unlikely Einstein did not know Nolan's work for the Comintern, and that, if he did not, it must have been willful ignorance on his part. On the other hand, if Einstein did know, why did he intervene, given that the man was a Soviet agent working on behalf of Stalin? Lytton comments, If one keeps in mind that communism at that time was already quite murderous, in the Soviet Union as well as in China, we are back again to the question of how much Einstein did want to know about the causes he supported. An additional fact that might have justifiably raised suspicions about Einstein's involvement is that the address he used in correspondence about the case was CO Internationale Arbeiterhilfe, Workers' International Relief, an organization founded under the auspices of the Comintern by the notorious communist propagandist Willy Munzenberg. It seems this episode might have been one of the reasons for the FBI's later investigation of Einstein. Lytton concludes, I believe that, temporibus illis, Einstein had laid himself open to the possibility of being used as a relay by the Comintern and Soviet intelligence, although I don't know to what extent he had been aware of it. The Nazification of America. It should be added here that the reluctance of people who were used as instruments of communist propaganda to criticize the totalitarian system of the Soviet Union was only one side of the coin. The other side was their tendency to picture the political situation in the United States in excessively negative terms, sometimes ridiculously so. Some examples of such statements from Einstein. We have come a long way toward the establishment of a fascist regime. The similarity of general conditions here in the United States to those in the Germany of 1932 is quite obvious. The separation between Jews and Gentiles is even more pronounced in America than it ever was anywhere in Western Europe, including Germany. Similar views were expressed by Einstein's friend, the logician Kurt Gödel, whose fame knows no bounds among philosophers, logicians, and mathematicians. John von Neumann, one of the greatest geniuses of the 20th century, called Gödel the greatest philosopher since Aristotle and said about him, Kurt Gödel's achievement in modern logic is singular and monumental. Indeed, it is more than a monument it is a landmark which will remain visible far in space and time. Here is how Goodell saw the political situation in the United States in 1951, four years after he became a U.S. citizen. The political situation developed wonderfully here during the holidays, and you only hear of defense of the homeland, compulsory military service, increase of taxes, increase of prices, etc. I think even in the blackest or brownest Hitler Germany, things were not that bad. One might think this opinion could perhaps be explained by Goodell's otherworldliness and possibly his unwillingness or lack of time to follow current events very closely. But this hypothesis is dubious. 
Around the same time, he wrote, For the last two months I have been so much occupied with politics that I had almost no time for anything else. There is evidence that Godel was already leaning strongly to the left as a young man. For instance, Rudolf Carnap noted in his diary on October 10th, 1931, Godel reads Lenin and Trotsky, is for planned society and socialism, and interested in the mechanism of influences in society, e.g. that of finance capital on politics. Amazingly, just a few weeks after the erection of the Berlin Wall in 1953, Godel's only reaction to that event, in a letter to his mother, was an attempt to justify the closing of the only remaining possibility for people in East Germany to flee the police state. The wall that was erected in Berlin, this is really a culmination. But the Russians are probably right that spies and saboteurs were coming there from the West. In a letter of July 7, 1965, he likens Charles de Gaulle to Hitler. Why do you ask me whether I like de Gaulle? His foreign policy has a lot of similarity with Hitler. And earlier, he described John F. Kennedy as encouraging the Nazis and fascists. With regard to the new president, Kennedy, one sees quite clearly already where his politics is leading. War in Vietnam, war in Cuba, the belligerent Nazis or fascists in the form of anti-communist organizations beginning to bloom, more rearmament, less press freedom, no negotiations with Khrushchev, etc. Notice how glibly anti-communists are equated with belligerent Nazis or fascists. It is odd for several reasons that someone like Godel would be throwing Nazi accusations at these two world leaders, each of whom, in his own way, showed great courage in fighting fascism during the Second World War. First, in 1935, Godel himself officially joined a fascist movement, the Fatherland Front, when membership became a condition for keeping a university position. Notice point number six, according to which a member of the Fatherland Front is bound by his honor to show unconditional loyalty and obedience to the Führer. 10. It should be stressed that Godel's livelihood at the time did not depend on his keeping that job in Vienna. The fame of his proof of the incompleteness theorem meant he could count on receiving invitations and job offers in many countries, especially in the United States. He already had a visiting position at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton in 1934. In fact, it was as late as 1941, well into the ninth year of Hitler's rule, and in the middle of the war, that Godel was still inquiring at the German consulate in New York about whether he could get a salaried position in Nazi Germany in case his application for the extension of his leave of absence was rejected by German authorities. Another potentially relevant fact is that Godel's wife apparently applied for membership in the Nazi party in 1938 after the Anschluss. Although presumably he must have known about this, there is no record of his reaction. Nor do we know what he thought about the annexation of Austria. Of Godel's letter to American mathematician Oswald Veblen, only a burnt fragment has survived. It is dated 26th of March, 1938, just 13 days after Hitler's Anschluss, 3-9. It would be interesting to know what, if anything, Godel had to say about that event, or what immediate effect it had on his life or work. But, incredibly, there is no mention of the Nazi takeover in any of Godel's correspondence. At the beginning of World War II, Godel was asked by the Austrian physicist Hans Thiering to warn Einstein that Nazi Germany might develop a nuclear weapon, but Godel never transmitted the message. So we see that when he was in a position to do something to support the anti-Nazi coalition, he failed to act, for the awkward reasons he gave later to explain his passivity. To the dismay of many of his friends, Godel traveled from the safety of Princeton to post Anschluss Austria in 1939 with the aim of convincing the Nazi authorities there to renew his university lectureship. He must have been aware that the condition for taking up the lectureship was signing an oath of loyalty and obedience to Adolf Hitler. It is hard to fathom why Godel wanted to go back to the city from which all other members of the Vienna Circle had escaped in any way they could and where even the university came to be almost completely Nazified. According to Karl Menger's report about the situation in Vienna a year or two before Godel's visit, the percentage of Nazis among mathematicians he was in contact with 
apart from some of his pupils, was not far from 100%. During that visit, Godel had no qualms about adapting to the new order and occasionally even ending a note with Heil Hitler. In the end, it appears that Godel left Vienna mainly because he was worried about his personal safety. He was once attacked in the street because he was mistaken for a Jew, and he was also in danger of being drafted into the German army after he was unexpectedly declared to be fit for military service. Months after Godel was back at Princeton, his application was finally approved. In the document issued on June 28, 1940, in the name of the Führer, he was officially declared to be a lecturer of the new order. He was also assured that he would enjoy the special protection of the Führer. And this time, Führer did refer to Hitler. Einstein and Godel became friends at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, and they had similar opinions about the post-war political situation. When it came to their critical attitudes toward the United States, their views were nearly indistinguishable. Now it is easy to understand that reasonable people could find some aspects of American politics in the late 40s and early 50s worrying or deserving condemnation. Many would especially single out the methods of Senator Joseph McCarthy in his clumsy and counterproductive attempts to deal with the dangers of communist infiltration. But to suggest that things in America were at that time worse than in the blackest or brownest Hitler Germany, or that the separation of Jews and non-Jews was even more pronounced in America than in the Third Reich, this borders on insanity. No, this actually crosses the border. And yet, these opinions come from two of the greatest minds of the 20th century.